Um, so hi everyone, I just wanted to start by saying thank you for joining us this evening. It's lovely to have you all here. Um, I'm Alice, if you don't know me, I'll be co-hosting with Charlotte who's also on the call. So if anyone needs anything at any point, you can contact one of us and we'll be able to pass on any questions or anything like that. Uh, we have a couple of hours of content for you guys this evening from our guest speakers. So to just outline a plan, we're starting with a pre-recorded talk from Jason Elliott entitled An Introduction to the Challenges Facing the Radiographic Workforce During COVID-19. We will then be talking live to Martin Floyd and Aidan Beverton and they will be discussing the effect that COVID has had on academic radiography. Next, Nick Tessier will be discussing the perceived barriers posed by the COVID-19 pandemic and their solutions in advanced practice. Finally, there has been a change to the original timetable. So if you had the original one, this is different from what you might have been expecting. Um, we'll be talking live to a group of students for a more informal interactive session entitled A Radiography Student's Perspective of Placement During Pandemic. Um, this should hopefully take us to around seven o'clock. So that should be plenty of time before the football for any of you rushing off to see the football. Um, and if anyone has any questions at any point, feel free to just raise your hand or pop them in the chat. Um, okay, lovely. So I'm going to hand over to Charlotte now to introduce the first session. Thanks, Alice. Um, so for those of you that don't know me, um, I'm Charlotte. I'm one of the clinical academic lecturers here at Cardiff University. Um, so I'm here to introduce Jason's session. So as uh, Alice mentioned, he's not with us today because uh, he had other commitments, um, but hopefully we will be sharing his video um, and you'll be able to watch that. So uh, Jason is a clinical and academic lecturer in diagnostic radiography at Cardiff. He joined the team in 2015, supporting clinical education in the Swansea region before starting a joint clinical and academic teaching role in 2016. Both his undergraduate and master's degrees were completed at Cardiff, uh, and he hopes in the near future to be studying again at his home university. A former cardiac and nuclear medicine radiographer, Jason takes a keen interest in workforce optimization and staff resilience, particularly in the context of patient and staff safety. Outside of work, you'll find Jason with his family, on his bike or playing music. Um, so thank you, Jason, for uh, doing this session for us. And I'm hoping that any second now, we will be able to uh, share his video. Hello there. It's a great privilege to be able to speak to you today on this topic. Thank you ever so much to the student team for inviting me to speak to you today. Um, this is a huge, huge thing to be speaking about because we're looking at our workforce from a different angle rather than thinking of directly of how we manage our workload physically. We're thinking of the, the, the kind of resilience factors and so much more about how radiographers manage their own personal well-being and health, which has an enormous, enormous impact on the profession in terms of how effective it is at caring for and treating for patients. So in the session that I'm going to cover with you today, what I'd like to do is just give you a little bit of a background into where we were before the COVID pandemic struck, just to give you some context, because very little has been looked into in terms of how we as radiographers work and live and look after ourselves and look after each other in terms of our well-being, our physical and our mental health and how that has a, an impact on our patients, primarily in the way that we can care and manage for them, but in another way, in how we physically manage our workloads, the demand on services as radiographers, and in the bigger picture strategically, how, how the profession works as a whole within the UK and across the world. What I'd like to do then is uh, discuss perhaps how things changed in the COVID-19 pandemic, because Obviously, this is an unprecedented event that has had a massive impact on us as diagnostic and therapy radiographers. And just looking at some of the impact that was uh, covered in the study that I was part of last year uh, and some of the recommendations made from there in context to some other future challenges, which we are aware of now that we've done that background research prior to COVID itself. So before the pandemic, in theory, we were in a position where there were already issues. Perhaps we were slightly less aware of them. Perhaps they weren't talked about so much. Perhaps they were a little bit taboo in some ways because as a profession, we're just expected to complete our tasks and to manage our workloads and to deal with the demand that there is on both diagnostic and therapeutic radiography services, both in the UK and beyond. 
and perhaps less was done about the uh, effects that might be having on the workforce. There are so many things that were already in place that were making for a, a, an existing instability in the system. So I'd just like to talk to you a little bit about that first. So as we know, there's been a huge demand increase on our services in diagnostics particularly. Uh, this is a big issue, particularly for our specialist imaging modalities, our ultrasound, our CT, our MRI. This has caused us to move to a completely different way of working. As uh, those in the UK will know, there's been a, a push towards a change of a seven day service with extended days of up to 16 hours of uh, open time for non-acute imaging services. Obviously, this is in response to this increase in demand that the Royal College of Radiologists were discussing, but it's becoming a greater than 15% increase year on year. And that's a huge challenge to meet in itself without discussing the other things that we need to kind of open that there are the elephants in the room here. So we do have an existing workforce shortage. Um, it is kind of variable depending on where in the UK you are. Um, turnover is a big problem, mainly because we have a lot of more experienced radiographers moving into part time. We have a lot of more experienced radiographers who are being either redeployed into specialist imaging or going into leadership and management roles. Advanced practice is growing due to a shortage of radiologists, which means then additionally our general sort of ground workforce is being depleted too. And while as uh, universities and higher education institutions, we are trying our best to produce high quality graduate diagnostic radiographers who are ready for the workforce, our capacity in terms of clinical placements, our capacity in terms of education and training only just keeps pace with that. We're not able to close the gap on the vacancy issue that there is in, in radiography at the, the present time. And finally, we're, we're still dealing with issues that while there is investment into the NHS, it's not directed necessarily perfectly into the right places. So we're hearing reports of lots of departments working with significantly outdated equipment that might be uh, in, capable of sort of producing a, a variety of different images and treatment types that are relevant for modern healthcare delivery. On top of that, the, the sheer uh, speed of how these pieces of equipment work may mean that efficiency is low and it takes a lot longer to image the same number of patients that could be imaged on more modern equipment. Uh, the other problem tends to be that these pieces of equipment are quite uh, sort of unmanageable in terms of their uh, resilience themselves physically. So we find that these equipment, these pieces of equipment break down more often. It's a lot harder to source parts. So as a result, downtime is a more significant factor for the departments running with these outdated pieces of equipment. And that uh, ends with all of these things together working to cause quite a lot of stress and uh, impact on the department and its ability to efficiently care for our patients and make sure that they have quality outcomes when they visit diagnostic and therapeutic radiography departments. In terms of actually studying radiographers themselves, very little has been done in terms of investigating or looking at the impact of workload and pressures on our teams of radiographers across uh, the UK, across the world. So uh, um, a systematic review that was done in 2019 tells us that actually no studies were done on radiographers at all um, in relation to workload in terms of resilience and in terms of their own performance deficits as a result of burnout or exhaustion or any other uh, shift work related disorders that may be caused by the sheer number of hours that people are completing and the pressures of that work that they're doing. Um, there's been plenty of, of uh, studies done in other professions, particularly in nursing, which can be applicable to radiography in terms of the care standards, in terms of the technical tasks, perhaps in a different way that are done. But we are seeing that there is a def major performance deficit issue for other healthcare professions, which is definitely relating well to what we'd expect in radiographers. And there is this significant problem here. There have been some scoping studies done that have looked at the fact that uh, staff are feeling tired. Staff are dealing with mental health resilience issues as a result of the shift patterns that they're working. But in light of radiation safety and particularly the patient care aspects in terms of our um, mismanagement of patients, our delaying of patient care due to errors uh, that occur within radiology, this is a significant issue that needs to be addressed. Um, there has not been any further study attempted at this point. Uh, that lots of scoping studies have been completed in terms of where uh, radiographers stand in terms of their knowledge of simple things such as how many hours they, uh, they should be working and when they should be saying no to changing shift patterns, 
how they should be managing the pressure, whether they have adequate support services from their occupational health teams, whether there is resilience management within the departments that they're working in or within the health boards that they're working in. So why is it important to consider these impacts? Well, firstly, in terms of strategic management of radiology and of healthcare as a whole, we need to think about how services are delivered and how our standards of care for our patients are maintained. It's very important that our patients are given the highest quality standards of care and that we perform at a high level. This is where we kind of work down to our workforce uh, impact management. It's discussing how well we can safely and uh, at a sort of optimum work to care for our patients, manage our throughput and manage our staffing workload, knowing that we're also on a finite budget when we're working in healthcare. And finally, looking at our individual members of staff, how they look after themselves and balance their work and life, and also how they're ma managing any mental health impacts that may arise as a result of working in a pressured environment. In terms of the impact of these stresses on radiographies and radiography workforce as a whole, we need to consider that patient care thing as being fundamental. I will keep repeating this all the way through this presentation, that our efficiency and delivery and our management of patient care and patient value and choice in the centre of their uh, patient journey is really important, but also the turnaround times because of the demand. We need to make sure that we're not delaying patients adequate and timely diagnosis and treatment uh, as a result of the, the stresses that we're dealing with. We need to consider how our facilities and our staff skills mix works um, to benefit the service and how we deal with vacancies and carry shortfall in staff numbers. Finally, how we work with our partners in other parts of our hospitals and our healthcare services in terms of managing demand and how we manage those extended services and managing expectations with other teams is really important that hasn't really been uh, looked at in a lot of detail, but how we kind of manage those issues that we have with say our theatre teams and with our ED teams and how we manage uh, their expectations on us, but also our expectations on them. When we consider the stresses that are then placed on our individual healthcare professionals within radiology, either diagnostic or therapeutic, stress is the most important one to be considering. However, when we consider the impact of the working hours that we may be uh, undertaking, this then takes us into that level of burnout where the physical and mental exhaustion starts to creep in. We're aware that moving on from this, that staff are reporting uh, mild to moderate depression and anxiety over their shift patterns and over their working experiences. This all forms a series of symptoms that we now know as shift work disorder. This can then feed on to some major issues with metabolic disorder, with insomnia, and with issues of staying awake when you are meant to be awake. So that obviously puts us into this position where patients will be perceiving us as less effective and less caring in terms of what we do. And it can cause significant error, whether that's uh, issues with individuals not being able to safely get to and from work or manage themselves outside of work to patient registration errors or even radiation dosage errors, either by mistreating uh, a patient or a patient having an unnecessary scan or the wrong type of scan done. This is where this becomes very significant and very dangerous, and we need to be considering how we mitigate these effects well. The problem, of course, is since then, we have moved into a new phase of COVID-19. And this has exacerbated things a little bit. Obviously, nobody was expecting quite the extent to which COVID-19 would extend across the world and the UK. And this has made a huge change in how we work as radiographers, both in diagnostic and therapy settings. So from a diagnostic point of view, chest X-rays and CT thorax and pulmonary angiograms have become primary imaging for our COVID patients. Our secondary conditions associated with COVID have become a significant uh, load on radiology departments as well. But then our varied sort of emergency and normal workload, which decreased significantly, but now is picking up again within our diagnostic departments, has become an issue. This has got to be tied in with managing appropriate social distancing within radiology departments. Obviously, we've also got to consider the risk to uh, radiotherapy patients who may have a decreased immune system or maybe more at risk generally of catching COVID due to other comorbidities associated with their condition. What we needed to discover is how this affected the radiographers and the teams that were managing these services during the pandemic. 
Strategically, on top of that, we've had the introduction of field hospitals, which may have stretched services in terms of uh, ability of access for radiographers, uh, how many radiographers could be available to run these services. Also, the changes of working pattern due to COVID demand, more out of hours staff needing to be available. Um, the time taken to change in and out of PPE, meaning more people needing to be available to backfill around that change particularly moving up to theatre or going into uh, red areas for any length of time, an increase in propensity of staff towards CT and mobiles, and how we've managed those day shifts with depleting numbers. Also looking at our infection control and social distancing measures between individuals as staff members, the loss of interaction between our colleagues, perhaps so much due to those social distancing and infection control measures, how we've managed loss of staff due to staff shielding or self-isolating, whether they have uh, picked up COVID whilst working or have been exposed to it in their social settings through no fault of their own. This has caused significant issue. And finally, it's really important as a higher education establishment to consider the effects of loss of students from the clinical department. As a clinical academic educator within the university that I work in, there was an obvious effect of not having those additional students available. Obviously, from an infection control and safety point of view, it is really important to protect those students who are in a different category to the qualified staff. However, the loss of those additional pairs of hands made a significant impact to the radiology department and not enough is said about the difference that students make to the management and efficiency of radiology services. Finally, the big impact from a personal level and working within the team at Cardiff University was the uh, the pressure on the individual departments that we worked in. We've obviously had no significant experience of seeing our colleagues and our qualified staff and our newly qualified radiographers who gradu graduated last year through the pandemic and the current students who are about to graduate. And the effects in terms of their workload, their resilience, because they've been working and training through this pandemic, which has completely changed the way that we educate and train radiographers. Um, the sort of anecdotal evidence so far is that the radiography students we've worked with have been really resilient and managed things well, but they've been very open about discussing their problems with us, which has helped us support them more uh, effectively. But in terms of the actual qualified radiographers and the services, we've seen enormous changes and a lot of pressure. I know plenty of staff who work within the university who work as clinical academics were involved in supporting services during the first and second waves of the pandemic and seeing firsthand the effects on the department, but also experiencing the stress of working within COVID itself was an experience I think that a lot of us will never forget and will uh, use wisely in our education and training of further students. So where are we going with this? Um, a group of uh, radiography educators worked together to actually discuss then what impact this has had on not only practice, but staff resilience within the UK. And this team of uh, educators and experienced lecturers worked together to put together a um, series of questions asked about a number of different things within how radiography practice changed during the COVID-19 pandemic. So what we were looking at is as part of a larger study across the world in terms of the COVID-19 response in radiology departments, we wanted to look at all of those healthcare professionals who qualify, those radiographers and radiotherapists, including those who joined the temporary register and assistant practitioners who were part of the pandemic response. What we were looking at is the impact on professional practice, infection prevention, and the stress that this was causing to radiographers. We snowball sampled this by a department leads in each area of the UK. So my responsibility primarily was to make sure that Wales was represented within this. We also shared via social media across the four week window that we were looking for responses. In terms of our sort of sample size, we decide uh, some calculations were done using Qualtrics to look at the number of radiographers in the UK and work out a sample size of a 380 would be representative as long as it covered different areas of the UK population. From a results point of view, uh, the study itself massively out stripped the expectations that the team had. So 522 responses was a far bigger number than the sample size that was hoped for. The split was 79-21 between diagnostic and therapeutic, but both professions were represented well. The vast majority of responses were from England. 11% of these were from Wales, where 
uh, I had a significant uh, interest in how these uh, result, results came through. We also had a number of third year students who'd taken up temporary registration who were involved in this project as well. 46 educators, three of which were clinical academics like myself, and 12 of the 522 were working in the third sector. We also had a few who were working either for charities or within manufacturing industry and radiography, so application specialist. The interesting significant figure is that 90% of those responding agreed that the radiology workforce was a frontline service in managing COVID, whether that was managing the radiotherapy patients and shielding them, but still providing treatment, or directly involved in diagnosis and management of those COVID-19 patients. What we discovered in terms of general impact is that 50% were pre-trained for COVID as the first wave was hitting. So in terms of managing resources, managing departments and supporting adequate use of infection control, uh, the changes in measures, but also donning and doffing PPE. So half of our respondents felt that they were adequately pre-trained for this. The common themes were lots of redeployment, particularly in radiotherapy out of services into more uh, patient management roles or onto wards. Within radiology in the diagnostic departments, we saw a lot of redeployment back into general departments to manage those chest x-rays and those CT chest scans that would be uh, massively increasing in number. We also noticed a significant in increase in pressure on these departments, but with another uh, a, a massive decrease in workload in other areas as COVID almost um, put the general public in this position where unless it was absolutely life-threatening, they didn't attend any emergency department or any hospital care. And to a point, a lot of services were actually shut down for these periods. The other thing that was a significant impact was the increase in time it took to image or treat patients due to the donning and doffing of PPE and those additional cleaning measures and social distancing. So something as bizarre as how much less capacity a waiting area would now have for uh, a number of patients to come in at the same time. This could end up in staggered appointments for different areas of the department and meant that they perhaps, even though there didn't necessarily need to be huge dip gaps between patients on the scanner, if it was adequately cleaned and rested, there may have to be another 10 minutes because there was no space in the waiting room for the next patient to come in. The other main changes were the uh, massive differences in shift patterns to match the needs of services, depending on where we were uh, in diagnostic or therapy. Uh, anecdotally, I know that local departments changed shift patterns to manage extended working days, but also increased the number of staff on night shift to manage the workload in both general and CT, plus the need to work in pairs or threes in departments to manage COVID patients and still manage the other workload and throughput. This did reduce the day workforce, which then had an impact on how much could be done, particularly in acute situations, which then led to more pressure on those staff working both at day and night. And we did notice some changes in how the staff felt in terms of their well-being and their resilience. This meant for a lot of staff, they were reporting an increase in working hours. I, there is some anecdotal evidence of some really excessive overworking. Um, due to needs of the service, which while is very important, is putting these radiographers in very dangerous situations. Obviously, maintaining COVID safe and fast services was very important, but we were way outside of those working time regulations in terms of compensatory rest and maximum hours worked during a period. Less than half of the respondents said that PPE was fully adequate and widely available, which then caused a significant fear of contraction of COVID-19 and increased stress levels in terms of we cannot cope with the workload that we're dealing with. 62.5% uh, said adequate training was uh, available. That's a good number, but it wasn't as high as you would hope within a healthcare service. You'd be hoping that was 100%. So the graph shown as well showed the kind of percentage of respondents who considered each of these different things a significant stress level. The most statistically significant were how staff were tested and also how afraid they were of contracting COVID-19. Obviously, other issues in the increasing workload were still considered events that radiographers responded about. But are these stresses new or old? So 63.2% of the uh, respondents suggested that the workplace stress they were feeling was a result of the changes due to COVID-19. 
but we are aware that uh, those previous scoping studies tell us that people really didn't understand the work-based stress or the effects of shifts on their body physically and mentally, which meant that perhaps they were unaware that the uh, tiredness and the mental health issues they may have been experiencing due to sleep deprivation were actually, they, they weren't aware that they were directly resulting to the shift patterns and the workload that they were working under. Um, the other big concern is that only only 30.7% of those respondents from the COVID pandemic response survey said that there was ac- adequate uh, service in place in terms of resilience management, how uh, they coped. So whether that was occupational health or additional measures put in place to manage well-being of staff, which then places a significant burden on the individual to manage themselves. Now, without adequate education and support in that way, external to their uh, working role, that does mean that there is a significant risk of these people becoming, becoming unwell or going through quite irreversible burnout measures. So what do we consider next? Well, we need to manage these things, don't we? We've got to look at the challenges that face us during the tail end of pandemic and into the new normal so that these working patterns may be here to stay to an extent. They may reduce in frequency, but we've got to look at how we manage and cope with the demand that's going to increase now post lockdown as services reopen, but also managing those waiting lists to make sure that patients are dealt with in a timely fashion. There is going to be a significant resilience and burnout issue within our force due to uh, short staffing and the stretching of teams to cover these uh, delivery of service for 24 hours for our COVID patients, but also now managing the huge backlog of diagnostics and treatment that is going to be uh, sort of throwing itself at our UK workforce over the next months and years. We've also got to consider that the impact on our staff is going to cause significant risks to patient safety in terms of reduced staffing numbers because of sickness absence, which may put us into unsafe care levels, but also those on-shift errors, which could only increase if we are in a situation like this. Particularly working with ionizing radiation, this is a really significant issue that we need to address and discuss as the radiography workforce, but as the profession as a whole within the UK and throughout the world. In terms of recommendations, some education and support for resilience within radiographers is really important. Um, The Society of Radiographers have started putting on wellbeing events and making available support directly through the, the, the society itself, which is really good. We also need to look at how education services and healthcare departments in terms of local health boards and uh, commissioning boards within different devolved parts of the UK, not just in Wales, but in England and Scotland and throughout the world need to look at how we care for our staff, how we look at how our staff are doing, asking people how they're doing and providing um, seminars and support days to be able to discuss how you manage yourself working in the physical and mentally demanding environment that is healthcare. We also need to look at service delivery and how we consider workforce management and how our department leads, our our superintendent radiographers, our radiology services managers are uh, gatekeeping the shift changes to make sure the staff aren't putting themselves in these dangerous positions, but also making use of their wellbeing services and occupational health teams to support managing those radiographers who do fall into the circumstances where they do end up being quite unwell as a result of this pressure and workload. But first, we need to research more. Uh, I'm really keen that as a profession, we start looking both in terms of qualitative and quantitative research on how radiographers are in themselves, how they deal with pressure, how they deal with the physical and mental demands of the work that they do, how the pandemic response has changed this and how workload stress can be mitigated. So can we use education and training to support our staff? Are we looking at the environmental measures right the way down to access to cold water, adequate food and resources around workload and encouraging our staff to look after themselves and rest in between shifts, making sure that as much as possible our uh, safe shift practice is observed and we are protecting our profession so that our our profession is caring for its patients well, is providing high quality diagnostic and therapeutic services and we are protecting ourselves and the reputation of radiographers across the UK. Thank you for listening. I really hope you found this informative. Obviously, if you wish to contact me and ask questions, I'm more than happy to discuss anything in relation to this topic with anybody. I'm hoping in myself I'll be uh, conducting further research into this in the near future. 
and collaborating with other people. So if you are interested in collaborating with me, please get in touch with me. I'll make sure that my contact details are available to you. I hope you enjoy the rest of this evening's session. Uh, well done and good luck to those who are also presenting. Thank you very much. Goodbye for now. Okay, so thank you very much, Jason, for um, sending that video in to us. Obviously, he can't be here this evening, but if anyone does want to get in contact with him about his research, um, then contact one of us and we can forward on his email address for you all. Um, so next up, we have our live presentation from Martin Floyd and Aidan Beverton. Um, so Martin has trained as a radiographer in South East Wales School of Radiography based at TDS at UHW. Um, he started his Diploma of the College of Radiographers in 1990. Prior to radiography, he'd also read sociology and geography at Swansea University, and he started his radiography career at Cardiff Royal Infirmary before moving to the Princess of Wales Hospital in Bridgend. After gaining promotion to Senior 1 and then Senior 2 in Bridgend, he spent most of his, cl his clinical time in casualty and in nuclear medicine. Following on from that, he moved to the School of Radiography in 1995, where he stayed until 2000. During his time here, he completed his postgraduate certificate in education. He then returned back to clinical practice and was funded to complete his reporting qualification here at Cardiff. By 2015, he came back to the school as a lecturer and he's now aiming to register as a PhD student. Aidan Beverton is a third year radiography student who's currently awaiting results and registration as a diagnostic radiographer. He also studied at Cardiff University and has had an active role in a, as a student rep co and committee member for the Radiography Society, being both secretary and co-president. More recently, Aidan has also helped out with open days at Cardiff University, providing a student perspective on any questions that prospective students may have. Aidan has secured his first post as a Band 5 radiographer at the Princess of Wales Hospital, much like Martin, and is lo um, looking to take an active role in providing students with a beneficial, supportive and informative placement experience. So I'm going to hand over to Martin, I think, is going first, and then Aidan will follow on from him. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Aidan is the Chris Whitty of the evening uh, and is going to do, the, to, to do the slides. So can everyone hear me OK? Yeah, perfect. Brilliant. Thank you. OK, so first of all, I want to say thank you all for attending uh, this, our first student led conference. I want to say a massive thank you to Charlotte as the driving force behind this. And then a big thank you to the student committee who developed and made this uh, webinar real. So here we are this evening at our first student uh, webinar. Um, I was really pleased to be asked to um, present this evening and, and I was given a really interesting topic uh, and that's the impact of COVID-19 on, on teaching and learning. So almost straight away I wanted to go into that sort of normal academic routine and, and find as much literature as I could written about the impact of, of COVID-19 on education and and there actually is a significant wealth of literature that's been published in the last year. But then I thought, no, that's a little bit boring just to hear study after study. And I thought, actually, um, let's make it a little bit more personal. So if we can go on to slide number two, Aidan. So what I really thought would be far better was to reflect really on what happened to us here in Cardiff and how we reacted as a programme to the, to the current situation. And, you know, I'll discuss on my own reflections from a, um, an academic perspective um, and then Aidan's going to discuss his reflections from a, from a student perspective. And I just noticed that I spelled Aidan's name wrong on my notes uh, and I've called him Ada, but I don't think that's appropriate, but I will go back to calling you Aidan. Okay, so if we go to the next slide, um, Aidan, that'd be great. Right, so where has COVID taken us in the last 14 months? So I remember March 2020, I was teaching an anatomy tutorial on the central nervous system, not a real favourite of mine. I was really glad of the interruptions from the group to take us away from the role of the basal ganglia and the limbic system. I really don't know why I've ever needed to know that as a radiographer, but there we go. And one of the students in the group, tutorial group, said to me, Martin, what do you think of this virus? It seems to be really bad in, in Europe. Do you think it's going to reach us? My response? Nah, we're going to be fine. Don't worry about it. We'll be OK. Now, that was sort of on the Thursday or the Friday. And that Saturday, I was in London visiting some friends. 
And it's the first time that I've ever seen London like a ghost town. There was literally no one around. We went to the Tower of London, we didn't queue, we got in, there was no time restrictions. I think I went on the escalator to see the crown jewels about three or four times. What did they know that I didn't? Uh, in actual fact, we were literally days away from the lockdown. And then on the 23rd of March, we had that famous statement from Boris saying that we were going into the first lockdown. By the 25th of March, they passed an act of parliament, it received royal assent, and by March the 26th, it became illegal now to live normally. So suddenly, we were thrown out of our building. So all of us teachers found ourselves working from home and thinking how on earth are we going to deliver an essentially practical and cl clinically driven programme. If we go on to point number four, uh, image number four, please, Aidan. Now at that point, Zoom, Teams, Collaborate were terms that were not in our everyday language. Now with luck, our first and second year holidays, uh, students were on holiday at that time of the initial lockdown. So we had a little bit of thinking time, but we still had students who had outstanding clinical placements and we still had students that had outstanding academic assessments. Our final year students at the time, the 2018 intake, were again writing up their dissertation. So that gave us a little bit of thinking time. So as a programme, we had to put our heads together to think, what on earth are we going to do? We had a really good management team in Howell and Julia. And really within days, Julia was able to put together a new um, block plan, a new schema that would allow us to recover any lost time that we were going to have from the programme. But the problem was that COVID-19 was a movable feast. As a country, we had little knowledge of the disease and we had no real perspective of how the disease would have a temporal development. In the grand scheme of things, as I said, we'd had a lot of our face-to-face -face academic teaching done, but we suddenly had to start delivering the remaining academic using Zoom and Teams. This was just a learning curve for everybody. Suddenly we had to download the software, we had to set up teams, we had to join teams, join t uh, Zoom meetings. It was a challenge for everyone. Um, it was a complete changing culture from an educational perspective. And we suddenly realised that actually teaching online is a very, very different beast. We can't see you. A lot of you a lot of students decided not to turn their, their cameras on. So we suddenly started teaching to a blank, blank screen. We couldn't see facial expressions anymore. So uh, expressions of understanding or confusion, that was taken away from us. So engagement became a big challenge. Interaction and discussion asking questions seemed to disappear. So communication appeared to take on a one-way presentation. And we started asking ourselves, how do we know that the students are enjoying this and they're getting it? It was a real problem. We could no longer have um, um, academic exams in the normal uh, format. We had um, no examination halls, we had no access to computer labs. So we suddenly had to shift to online examinations and suddenly they became open book. We had no form of invigilation. But again, that gave rise and concerns to us because suddenly students' intranet strength became an issue. And at times we had students' internet collapsing at the very point of submission. So we suddenly had to implement a, a process of giving you extra time or giving students extra time to accommodate for IT errors. So we were kind of getting there with academic, but a massive challenge was clinical because suddenly the Welsh government and the local health boards decided that they didn't want students in clinical placement and we now lost our clinical placements. We now had to think, 
how on earth are we going to manage 24 weeks of clinical shared over the three cohorts? You know, clinical is the core of our programme. You have to have your clinical skills and you have to pass clinical assessments. Thrown into this mix then was the HCPC deciding to open a temporary register for our final year students, as well as the Welsh Government and the HCPC allowing um, level four students to suddenly take part in paid work within the care sector. So we were trying to deliver an education programme while at the same time students were facing decisions about do I stay and listen to lectures or should I make some extra money working for the Welsh Government? So the clinical tutors really came into fruition here. The support we had from the clinical academic team was phenomenal. Suddenly, we had this enormous wealth of online clinical learning. It was the only way we could do now clinical learning. We had a whole series of resources provided. The learners completed the online resources, signed themselves off as having completed that, and that then became our record that students had achieved some form of clinical learning. Initially, we thought that by July 2020, we would have things sorted, the pandemic would have gone, everyone would have been back in into clinical. But actually, this is where we, it all went wrong again. The pandemic worsened and actually we realised that we were going to lose the whole of the summer in terms of clinical education and we weren't going to see uh, students returning to any form of clinical and academic study until September 2020. So at this point I suppose I do want to think about you know what a little bit of, of, of literature that was that was published and that was a, an article that was published by Rainford in 2020, which was one of the first studies that looked at the impact of COVID on clinical training. And what I want to do is just pick out some of the themes that were identified in that research uh, and how they actually linked with our students um, at Cardiff as well. So the article by Rainford identified that COVID was not just affecting radiographers, it was affecting radiology and it was affecting radiography and radiology trainees across the world. It was a global impact. Globally, departments didn't want students, so very similar to the situation in Wales. And again, in parallel to Wales, many students were anxious of the risk of transmission. And again, that came through in the study by Rainford. We suddenly had to deal with lots of student inquiries about anxiety in terms of taking COVID back to, or potentially taking COVID back to their homes and to their family. And certainly the students in that study that continued to work in placement um, found that actually the workload in departments had changed so significantly that the normal outpatient departments weren't running, ED uh, um, admissions were low, and so doing clinical assessments was an absolute challenge. Again, those who remained in clinical placement had issues around travelling on public transport. And certainly as our students started to return to um, clinical work in September of 2020, that became an issue as well. Trying to find out where students are safe to share cars, because that's the most common mode of transport, is sharing cars between placement, became an absolute challenge. No one would give me a definitive answer. We can go to the next slide please Aidan. So towards the end of 2020 um, what I wanted to do was capture a little bit about what were students feelings up to that point in time. How had Covid affected them? What did they enjoy about online learning? And you can see that I had quite a lot of positive responses. Suddenly online learning for many learners was a big advantage if they had caring responsibilities. A lot of students felt it was less intimidating and actual, actually they could ask a question by the chat function and didn't have to sort of uh, put the question uh, and ask the question out loud. They enjoyed the directed online learning. They, avoid, they enjoyed not having to travel to Cardiff maybe for just one lecture or for one practical. One thing they did say, they enjoyed the pre-recorded material, um, they enjoyed videos, 
but actually just to think of varying the way in which we were capturing material. But one thing, you know, we did have um, uh, negatives, and that was that online learning and certainly the loss of clinical had affected students' confidence. And it's really hard looking at a computer screen for hour and hour and hour. So some really good points there in terms of finding out what was it like, how did, how did online learning um, go down? If we go to the next slide, please. So clinical placement, as we said, planned for the summer of 2020 was gone. Uh, and we had to plan for the return of students coming back in 2020, again, to online learning. Um, and we did this time have the green light in September 2020, late September, to allow students to go back into clinical placement. But clinical placement was a massively different place. It had changed since the last time the students were out on, on, on placement. Suddenly they were dealing with social distancing between themselves and with, and with staff. So suddenly camaraderie and support was lost by that physical distance. Students had to wear protective equipment all the time. Um, it had a continuing impact on clinical assessment. The number and range of patients coming into the department was still very small. So we had um, a well-established structure by the time we came back to 2020 in the new academic year. We were established in our online lectures. We had our clinical um, placements back in. But I think what we had to face then was thinking of the future. And the next slide, please, Aidan. And uh, we were very lucky, Karen and I were very lucky to be invited with a group of other researchers. Um, Sonia is Sonia McFadden from, from Ulster, one that um, Jason has worked with. Um, and we thought actually, do you know what? COVID is going to have late effects. We know there's a condition known as late COVID, but in actual fact, there's going to be a late COVID effect on education as well. And we wrote a letter to the Journal of Radiography to raise concerns about our worries for students going forward um, over the next couple of years. You know, we, we thought, and in that letter, we identified that probably students will need a prolonged period of perceptorship. Maybe this year and for the next couple of years, students won't hit the ground running when they start employment. We might see some positives for students going forward as departments become busier, as initiative clinics are put in place to catch up with outstanding examination. But our other concern was that something that uh, Jason picked up on, students and staff are in burnout. They have had one hell of a 14 months and that may well affect their relationship with students. They may be physically worn out over the next year or so to be able to have maybe a productive relationship with students. We've got to think as well in terms of the long-term effect of students coming into radiography generally. We're now in the second year of students not having sat A-levels appropriately. We might see an increase in applications for the course um, reflecting the media coverage of the NHS and this life-saving media portrayal. So we've got to think of uh, the long-term effect of the kind of candidates that we might see coming into radiography. And linked to that, we may, we may well see an increase in the number of mature applicants coming through as suddenly some jobs that have been shown to be very challenging and at risk during COVID may suddenly have disappeared and health and health related jobs may be seen as the long term job that will give security. So that was my perspective from education. And now I think Aidan's going to give his perspective and reflect that of students. Hi, everyone. And um, thank you, Martin, for that introduction and Alice as well. So, um, yeah, I'm Aidan. I'm a third year student in that sort of awkward zone now where I'm awaiting results to register with HCPC but almost newly qualified hopefully so um like Martin this is going to be a sort of um reflection on my experiences as a student during the pandemic 
So initially we were um, taken out of placement and sent home. So I remember being on placement, I think we had a week of crossover with the um, third years. So the ones above us, because we were in second year and um, everything starting to kick off, hearing about people coming back from France and like spreading, you know, this unknown virus and it all just being quite unknown. And like Martin was saying, none of us really knew how serious this was going to be. But then when we were sent home from university, it all became a bit more real. And um, I think this was around end of February, beginning of March. So we had finished our placement block, but we were then sent home. So it was a confusing, stressful time for me and for all students, I'm sure, probably, you know, as Martin was saying, globally, none of us really knew what was going on, how would it impact us. And um, there were worries from the student cohort about graduating and underlying health conditions or you know, was the course going to be extended and what sort of implications this would have on us as students, even in the second year. So I remember we were contacted by HEIW, which is Health um, Education in, in Improvement in Wales, I think, I might've got that wrong, but um, they asked us to opt in or opt out to this um, uh, almost healthcare assistant um, role to help within the pandemic and I've got lots of peers um, who do nursing who were drafted and still help out but um, we were given this opportunity and I remember um, being quite keen to help out but then also lots of students were thinking if I don't help out am I going to have to take an interruption of study will this delay my graduation so it was quite a big decision to make and we it was all quite broken up the communication we had with HEIW and they were coming from a separate standpoint to the university so it was all quite odd and quite confusing so after a lot of us had made that decision, HEIW then changed their minds and decided that we were no longer needed, which was another cause of stress for people because um, it felt like we were constantly being told different things. I remember being very keen to help and gain experience and then being disappointed when we were told we weren't needed because I'd been working at a job, telling them I was going to be going back to Wales to help out and then it never happened. Um, I am aware there are some students in my year who did uh, manage to take up roles with track and trace to aid the situation so that did work out for some people so for the first few weeks after we'd been sent home it very much felt like we were in the dark and we had communication from the university but the lecturers and the faculty didn't know either what was going on so it was a really sort of tough situation we were hanging off of emails waiting for communication and having no idea what was going on it was quite a stressful time having absolutely no idea what was happening. So obviously um, we missed a vast amount of clinical hours. I think when we were in second year, we were due to have a five week block and a six week block in the summer. And we missed all of that. So 11 weeks of placement, that's you know half a year for us. And um, we missed out on all those opportunities. So um, we did have an option to come into placement for some um, sites across South Wales. because I know some hospitals were different with accepting students, but um, I managed to go into uh, Bridgend Hospital for a couple of weeks during the summer on my own foot, just sort of like, you know, get my experience back up and confidence and everything. And that was quite insightful actually, because that was the first time I'd been back in clinical since the pandemic had started. Um, but for that time we had to miss also, we had to do more clinical hours in our third year, uh, meaning that we had to miss out on our elective period, which we would have just done. This was a shame, um, but lots of us were just happy to be graduating on time because I know the physiotherapy cohort had been extended until the end of August, so they won't be graduating until September. It was a shame though, because in normal times, um, we could have chosen to do our electives at the sites we'd received jobs. And also many students like to travel abroad for um, their electives. So we did miss out on those opportunities, which is a shame. Um, we hadn't um, finished our competencies, many of us for second year. So to help with that, the university set us competency quizzes for each modality to ensure that we had more knowledge on the modalities. And this definitely helped, I would say, with awareness of um, you know, the different modalities, especially in second year, which is when you do all the modalities. But um, actually hands on doing these in clinical is far more beneficial. And I think I can speak for most of the student body that um, the quizzes were good for awareness. But at the end of the day, on you know, a practical hands on degree like this, you need to be in placement on site, seeing and you know, breathing these um, experiences. Um, so, yes, yeah, so 
pulling us out of placement also meant that n like not all of us had finished our second year assessments. So at the university I was at, we do um, a CT head assessment and we do an operating theatre assessment in second year. I had managed to do my CT assessment, which was great, but I hadn't done my theatre one. So um, these had to be done in our third year. But I will say the clinical lecturing staff have been very, very good and flexible with helping us balance preparation for these outstanding assessments, but also the preparation for our third year assessments. Um, also with assessments, um, I think Martin also said we had our online exams and this was completely new for all of us. And I just remember a horrifying moment when um, I, I think I'd got to like the seventh question of one of the OSPEs we had. And um, I was working in like uh, an unstable Wi-Fi in my house and um, the Wi-Fi went down I went to click back and I'd lost all of my answers with like half an hour to go. So if we hadn't had that extra hour, I would have probably failed that exam. So that was very stressful. And it's worth bearing in mind that, you know, it is more difficult doing remote examinations to coordinate. So, um, yeah, that was quite stressful. <laughs> um, to make sure we were safe on placement, we also had like COVID risk assessments, which were good from the clinical lecturing staff. So we were given a score based on these um, assessments and this would see if we were deemed safe to be in placement and the appropriate measures taken to ensure that we were safe. So this was reassuring as a student. So now sort of more long-term implications for students and newly qualified. So um, obviously we missed these 11 weeks of placement, but also that was from my year. The current year below us now, so the second years, they missed out on it loads of placements so I know they have five weeks in the beginning of their course of the year in first year but then in the summer they have 10 weeks and I can say personally during these 10 weeks is when I developed massively as a student and I was feeling quite confident by the end of these 10 weeks but the current second years missed out on that and this means that this means that they went into their second year only having five weeks of placement experience so this did mean departments had to be more nurturing because the current second years went into placement with essentially the knowledge and skills of the first year. And I know that speaking to some of the year below that they have found it hard with some radio offers having quite high expectations, especially with the pressure on departments as a result of COVID-19. And that's not to say for all radio offers, but there was that sort of, you know, extra like nurturing they needed only having a few weeks of placement experience. Um, talking about sort of um, demand on the departments as well, they've been very short staffed. So in my second year placement, I remember there was a random swab for all of the department on for COVID. And um, I think it was like an astonishing figure, like 45% of all the radiographers were positives so had to go home, leaving the department, you know, almost 50% down for two weeks at that point. And as a student, you know, you're trying to learn but then not trying to get in the way and there weren't enough staff to teach and it was quite um it was quite daunting and then also in my third year so just gone um they were so short staffed that um they had to ask me a student to stay on till eight o'clock just to help out because there were no staff members that could you know come and help and it, it was a great feeling that i was getting getting trusted as a third year student but also it sort of brings to light how departments are coping with these staffing issues. So um, now like sort of online learning, it was better than I had thought because of the convenience. However, in my sort of experience, I found that it did make me a bit lazier because you don't have that routine. You know, normally you'd be getting up, having a shower, walking into university, being ready for nine o'clock. But with online lecturing, you could set your alarm for, I don't know, like, 8.58, roll out of bed, click go on your laptop and then just be in your bed to watch the lecture. So I don't know, I think it has been great for people, um, you know, mature students and people that have obligations, but also it has its negatives as well. Um, some students also will have missed out because of the fear of speaking out on Teams or Zoom calls. I think um, it's much nicer to be able to speak to a lecturer at the end of a lecture, a lecture, sorry, especially if you're less confident. So some people probably have been more quiet this year meaning they maybe have missed out on some experiences however though staff have been very very supportive the whole time and it's been easy to arrange meetings with them via teams i think it's actually been easier to arrange online meetings rather than in-person ones and um as students we can understand that these changes are strange and confusing for us you know going online but it's also 
strange and confusing for the lecturing team because we've all been put into this situation all at the same time. There was a point, you know, where nobody knew what was going on, but we've all learned as a student and staff body. And I think it's been, it was it was very good by the end. So that was great. Um, so as my year and our qualifying, some long term effect of COVID will definitely be that we're going to have consider we'll, we will have had considerably less placement experience than that of previous years. So we will need more nurturing and support as we transition from student to practitioner. And I think departments are aware of this. They're, you know, they know the current situation and hopefully the support will be there with extended preceptorship programmes and things like that. Um, so the online resources from the university did help with some bits, but um, I think I've said this already, but at the end of the day, actually being in placement is so much more beneficial because we are hands on learning. Um, these were reassuring, though, these quizzes and online resources, because lots of us hadn't um, had all of our competencies signed off for the modalities. And um, this was a point of stress. I know even some students up until recently, but um, these students, um, sorry, these competency quizzes meant that in our third year, we could worry more about our general lecture experience and getting all of our general competencies signed off knowing that we'd done these quizzes to at least have the awareness and the um, competency signed off for those modalities. Um, so I think I'm sort of coming to the end, but um, you know, the contrast of clinical experience pre and during COVID has been massive. So I remember when we started in 2018, mask wearing was only a thing in theatre and in my placement site, um, not all theatre cases were needed. So it was only, um, during some orthopedic cases that you would need to wear a mask. So now, you know, you're walking into hospital mask on, you can't see anyone's face. It is vastly different. Also staff rooms. So um, in my second and third year placements, you know, you'd usually be sat around with everyone chatting in a staff room. And it was nice because as a student, you'd feel part of like the sort of the family of the department, but that has changed significantly with chairs being turned around to maintain social distancing and, um, yeah, it's just not the same anymore. And I can see this, um, you know, playing out for a while. Masks aren't going to go away, especially for hospitals. I know we had that announcement yesterday to be announced in a few days, but I know for a hospital, you know, in a hospital, masks are going to be with us to stay for a while. But um, it has been a shock to the system, especially um, looking at the changes um, during COVID. And um, hopefully there will be some more light at the end of the tunnel as we start to. Um, come out of COVID. So yeah, fingers crossed. But um, yeah, I will hand back now to um, Charlotte and Alice. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Aidan and Martin. That was really insightful there. Um, does anyone have any questions for them? We've had a couple through um, already. And then if anyone else has any to ask, then just pop them in the Q&A box um, and we'll read them out for you. So. I've had a question through here for Martin. So, um, Martin, what do you think are the positives that we can take forward from, uh, from COVID and future education? Um, I think we've got to look at an end to the stand up for an hour and give loads of information in a standard lecture format. I think what we're looking for, the positive mood going forward, is that content heavy content can be delivered in a pre-recorded session. So we can take the face-to-face uh, -face time, whether we have that in a lecture or whether we have to continue online, that can become more of a point and an area for discussion uh, and investigation um, and far more interactive. But also I think it's given us the push to think about developing um, not just videos, but things like podcasts, things like sort of cartoon type um, material. So to vary the digital online learning that, that we use. So we, we have got some positives that we will take forward. Thanks, Alice. Uh, Aidan, I've got a question for you. Actually, as well. Um, so what can new radiography students do to prepare themselves for the implications COVID-19 has had on education? So for new students, I think being open-minded and keen to learn and flexible is such an important thing. You know, we've got these varied shift times now and um, there are lots of things that we're doing differently. 
for the online lecturing, I think it's important to implement this into a sort of routine. So I know when we were doing online lecturing, um, me and my housemates would go for walks sometime during breaks to break it up because, you know, staring at a screen for hours and hours on end just isn't, you know, very nice. And everyone can appreciate that, I'm sure. Um, go for walks, get exercise and rest in. But then also, um, I think more clinically, you need to just get stuck in. It can be daunting, especially, but get stuck in, be proactive. Um, the more you put into placement, the more you'll get out of it at the end of the day. So um, I think get stuck in, be open-minded and be happy to be flexible and you'll get out as much as you, as you can. Brilliant, thank you, Aidan. Um, I'm conscious of time. Um, so I think if anyone um, has any other questions, um, if you can let myself and Alice know, and we can always pass those on to Aidan and Martin, um, and I'm sure they'd be happy to answer them. So um, I'm going to lead on to our next session now. Um, so we've been joined by Nick Tessier. So Nick's going to do our next session. So Superintendent Nick Tessier studied radiography at the University of Hertfordshire as an alumnus of the class of 1995 followed by his graduation in 1998. In 2008, Nick assumed the role of superintendent in radiological departments at the acute unit at Watford General Hospital. Since 2013, Nick has undertaken postgraduate teaching at the University of Hertfordshire as a guest lecturer, particularly pertinent to CT head pathology. In aid of advanced practice within radiography, Nick began performing percutaneous CT guided drainages in 2015. In 2016, Nick was promoted to Band 8A as Lead CT Superintendent for West Hertfordshire Hospitals Trust and is currently undertaking a CT head reporting course. Um, so Nick, I will pass over to you uh, and we'll look forward to your session. Okay, right, let me just square my, share my content, just one sec. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, advanced practice in radiography and uh, a little bit about the barriers posed by COVID-19 um, and then quite a bit more about CT guided drainages, which is my sort of area of expertise. So what is the problem? Uh, well, during COVID-19, we had a lack of radiologists because of shielding, because of sickness uh, with COVID and, and, and other, other conditions. We had issues with childcare. We had uh, problems with people being pinged with contact uh, tracing apps and coming back with lateral flow tests that not, weren't necessarily positive. And, and that meant that we had a significant lack of radiologists to, to take up um, a lot of the, the normal roles that they would be performing within our department. So the solution, well, the solution's got the radiographers to do it. Um, now, at West Hearts, uh, we have um, a reasonable number of radiographers that are performing advanced practice and that's everything from normal plain film uh, radiograph reporting, CT heads, histosalpinograms, pick lines, barium swallows, MSK injections and uh, myself doing CT guided drainages. So it's a little bit about me. Um, uh, let's jump over that because I'm quite conscious of time. So all CT uh, CT percutaneous drains are classed as airway generating procedures, which means that we need to use full PPE regardless of the patient's COVID status. Um, now, because we had a lack of staff um, with people shielding, that meant that we, we had considerable problems actually staffing the rest of the sort of normal department, let alone undertaking some of these advanced techniques. Um, during the first and second wave, COVID almost stopped pretty much all of the uh, standard surgery that was going on within the radiology departments. Now, many of the percutaneous drains that uh, I do are as a result of post-operative complications. So those numbers initially dropped uh, quite, quite considerably. Um, but the fact that we didn't have the radiologists around meant that I was doing an awful lot more. The numbers are now picking back up and actually we're, we're probably back up to pre-COVID uh, figures. Um, the patients that we're seeing, however, are much sicker. 
often profoundly septic. And we're using percutaneous drains uh, in place of surgical procedures, which commonly would have been done. And if I give you some examples of uh, patients that have uh, perforated appendixes, uh, historically the patient would have been covered with some antibiotics and then they would have gone in and, and operated on them. Uh, but because we have that really limited amount of surgical um, uh, theatre slots, uh, we've been trying to manage these with percutaneous strains. And exactly the same has happened with patients that are profoundly septic with uh, acute gallbladders, uh, so patients with cholecystitis. And um, indeed, we've been doing cholecystostomies, which are basically putting a drain into the gallbladder. So percutaneous drainage allows us to treat collections. It has major advantages over ultrasound when it comes to quite a large majority of patients because we're able to see uh, as, as deep as necessary. So uh, we wouldn't have an issue with putting a drain in 25 centimetres uh, if it was necessary using CT control. But ultrasound will struggle much over 10 centimetres. Um, one of the negatives, of course, with, uh, uh, with CT is it does involve a radiation dose. However, the area that we're looking at can be coned down to uh, uh, sort of about 15 millimetres in total. So when, once we've had an initial scan done, um, the, the area that we're radiating the patient is, is really tiny. Uh, they, do, they do receive um, uh, sort of equivalent of uh, um, a dozen or so chest x-rays every time we hit that button. So we, we have to be very aware that uh, uh, the doses that we're giving are, are accumulative. But uh, uh, because CT gives us such good visualisation of bowel and blood vessels, it allows us to be much more accurate when it comes to positioning our drones. So I think I've pretty much gone through this already. Benefits of CT, it, really we can uh, remove a collection uh, by inserting a drain to treat sepsis. We're able to obtain a, a sample of uh, the fluid, usually pus uh, to be fair, uh, and send that off to the lab for microbiology. And uh, they're able to work out if there is a bug that's causing the patient's issues, which antibiotics will kill those bugs the best. It's much less invasive than surgery. And on the whole, there's no need for general anaesthetic or really heavy sedation. The vast majority of the time, we can get away with using just local anaesthetic, uh, maybe a bit of entonox, maybe a bit of light sedation wherever necessary. There are some significant risks which are associated with performing a percutaneous strain, and they include infection, pain, bleeding, damage to surrounding structures, which, you know, pretty much any area of the body which requires a drain, um, we're, we're able to do CT guided drains, and, and, and I'm more than happy to put, uh, put a drain into pretty much uh, any structure which may have a collection. Um, so we do get close to some major blood vessels. We do go through uh, some other major structures. Uh, I will quite often do transhepatic drains if uh, we are worried about a patient with uh, a gallbladder empyema. Uh, and uh, so the procedures that we're doing are not without risk. Um, it's possible to perforate a patient if you were to uh, put a, uh, an introduced needle into the bowel. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, it's, it's possible that you could kill the patient. So when we consent for these procedures, we have to make sure that the patients are aware of you know, every possible risk. So having a radiographer doing percutaneous strains is quite unusual. I think that's probably fair to say. Um, I'm one of a handful of radiographers that uh, do this type of procedure. Uh, and there's only a couple of us that will do this procedure under CT. Uh, the vast majority of uh, consultant radiographers that are performing these procedures will be doing so on breast patients or um, they'll be using ultrasound uh, to do shallower collections. So after many years of uh, working, in fact it's decades working with radiologists doing this type of interventional technique and having witnessed how stressed the clinicians get because actually we had a significant wait for these procedures. We had a rather limited number of consultants that would be prepared to do this. Uh, I asked the question, why can't a radiographer be trained to do this? And after, to be fair, about five years of research and uh, uh, messing around writing protocols and getting approval, 
uh, one of our consultant radiologists, uh, Dr. Patel, um, encouraged me to, uh, to, to actually start doing these procedures myself. Uh, the, the protocol was backed by our interventional radiologists, in fact, all seven of them, uh, our radiology services manager, our clinical director, everyone was very keen to, uh, to, to get a radiographer involved in this. Uh, and it was felt that I would be the appropriate person. Uh, none of our radiologists opposed this protocol, which, to be honest, I was a bit amazed about. But um, percutaneous drainages are not the sexy end of uh, intervention. Uh, they are quite often uh, an area which no one really wants to touch. They can be quite smelly. And uh, um, <laughs> it, it's probably fair to say that uh, when our radiologists realised that I was going to be taking over part of the service, actually, uh, a lot of them were more than happy. So it's great career progression for myself. Uh, it allows the patients to have these procedures done uh, at a much more flexible time. And uh, at the end of the day, we, uh, we, we save lives. Um, we have patients that are acutely septic, which really need an interventional procedure to, uh, to remove that sepsis. And quite often these patients are too unwound to have an operation. So radiology is, um, is pretty much the only option. In 2014, the average wait for a CT drainage was 20 hours at our trust. Uh, the, and pre-COVID, the average wait then dropped to 3.8 hours with me doing the vast majority of those. So my scope of practice, uh, essentially every procedure that I perform must have been discussed with a consultant radiologist. And uh, I will then have a discussion with the clinicians that are actually looking after the patient. And uh, personally, the radiographer must have completed the, uh, the training and assessment program. Uh, I'll go into that now. So we were trained with our in-house radiologists where we observed and assisted on 15 cases. We then assisted the radiologist doing 15 cases and then were supervised in the room uh, for another 15 cases. So 45, um, 45 patients. Uh, and that took about a year because uh, we had to pick appropriate cases to start off with. Uh, actually, some drainages are very, very simple and actually don't really require uh, a huge amount of risk. Uh, others are much more, much more uh, involved. And I'll, I'll take you through some cases in a minute. Um, so pre-procedure, the radiographer discusses the procedure with the radiologist and the team. We decide exactly um, what we're going to do in terms of anaesthetic. Uh, I have... Um, a radiologist which will then prescribe my contrast agent, my local anaesthetic, and also my pain relief, which uh, the vast majority of the time is Entomox. We could have gone down the road of a, a patient group directive, but uh, actually there were lots of hoops to jump through just for the local anaesthetic um, PGD. And as I'm discussing the cases with a consultant each time, uh, it's, it's not a big uh, stretch to get them to prescribe uh, the drugs that I require for the procedure. So things to consider. Is it appropriate to be doing the procedure? Uh, is it safe? Uh, is the patient anticoagulated? And what the clotting factors are? So all of this is down to the radiographer that's doing the drain, or the radiologist that's doing the drain. Um, we also need to consider if there are any other options. Um, if uh, it is, uh, oh, oh, um, it may be possible to uh, treat the patient conservatively with just some antibiotics. It may be that the patient requires an operation. Um, so the clinicians are involved heavily in those decisions uh, uh, and are sort of stand to one side and uh, you know, just explain what is possible from my point of view. It's all zooming up there. So consent, uh, I will do uh, formal consent for the patients. Um, the referring team will discuss the procedure with the patient prior to them coming to me. So they, the, the patient, when they come down, will be aware of the procedure that they're going to have done. And then I will do the formal consent um, in one of our waiting rooms. It is possible that uh, patients won't be uh, appropriate to have uh, to give their own consent. And uh, there are times when I need to do a consent form four, which is a sort of a best interest um, case, but that will only ever be done with uh, um, discussion with the consultants looking after the patient. 
So we do a little scan. Um, we can send the patient. We measure the area of the collection and the, the, um, the sort of location of the uh, entry point that we, that we want to use. We mark an entry site. We cover the patient with sterile drapes. We administer some painkillers, so local anaesthetic. Um, depending on the patient's size, we can go up to 20 mils of 1% lignocaine. Uh, I can use Entonox, which is a wonderful painkiller um, for, for, for patients. It has a very, very quick onset time and a very, very quick offset time. And it's a mixture of 50% oxygen and 50% nitrous oxide. It's what they used to call la laughing gas or ga gas and air. Um, we will also consider full bone station with the team that's looking after the patient uh, or a, a full blown general anaesthetic if it's necessary. It's quite rare to need those. Um, but if patients have had procedures previously and they've not tolerated them well, that would probably be where we would consider a general anaesthetic. Or indeed, if the patient wasn't able to consent on their own and they needed to be done uh, on a consent form four, then a general anaesthetic is probably more appropriate. So we use the CT in-room technique and basically uh, we put lead aprons on and we're able to control the CT scanner from uh, the room itself. Now, quite often I'll actually do my own radiographic technique. I'll, I'll scrub up the front of the uh, CT scanner and put a remote control uh, into a sterile bag. So I'm able to uh, control the CT scanner uh, completely. Uh, and that, that means that I can be much more accurate and, and actually very quick when it comes to uh, performing the procedure. So I always use a Saldinger technique, which um, I, I'll explain to you now. It's just a, a better procedure for, uh, for percutaneous strainages. And certainly when you're involving uh, the CT scanner and you're having to bring the patients uh, in and out. Uh, so we give our local anaesthetic, our internox, we make a small incision. We introduce um, a introducer needle, which is basically a, a hollow plastic tube with a, a sharp in the centre. Uh, we'll then introduce that um, introducer needle into the collection itself, uh, remove the centre portion of it, introduce a guide wire. We then take out the original introducer needle and use dilators to make the hole big enough for us to pass the drain um, over the top and we then stitch the drain in place. So you might think, okay, you're, you're doing these procedures, um, uh, how, how are you able to do this? Well, the Society of Radiographers in Shawnee, uh, and indeed if there's a written protocol and a scheme of work for uh, any additional procedure, and you have a discussion with the Society of Radiographers, they are often more than happy to insure you. Uh, I also have vicarious liability from the uh, trust that I work at, uh, and they will take responsibility for any of my mistakes. Hopefully, um, there won't be any mistakes. I've done about 500 of these procedures and I've yet to have any major issues. So we audit the, um, the procedures that I do. In fact, all cases are audited retrospectively by um, some of our interventional radiologists and look at the uh, entrance point, the position of the drain, and also the waiting time. Um, Quite interestingly, um, I'm able to report uh, the CT drains, uh, even though I hadn't finished a dedicated reporting course at the time. Um, and as long as you're only descriptive, uh, and in this case, it's going to be saying that I've cited a drain in a certain place uh, and the size of the drain and how it was tolerated by the patient. Uh, any additional reports I get from a radiologist. So the Getting It Right First Time uh, National uh, Programme actually mentioned the service that we have at West Hearts um, a couple of years ago. And uh, there's, a, there's the quote, I think it's uh, page 64 or something, uh, and it is me they're referring to. That was quite nice. Uh, the Getting It Right First Time team came round and did an inspection in our department. And uh, we explained various things that we do and the uh, additional roles that radiographers are taking on. And this was the bit they chose to, uh, to publish. So I was, um, I was very happy about that. So I'm gonna look at a couple of case studies here. And um, let's, let's, see, let's see, under normal circumstances, I would have people actually shouting out the answers, but I think we'll just, we'll just go through them and I'll, uh, uh, and I'll show you what I've done and how I've done it. So this is a 22 year old lady who has 
and I will sew us collection that was seen on MRI scan. Um, she had previous tuberculosis and she'd been treated for 14 months, but had missed some of her medication in the last few months. Um, so we did a CT scan and uh, we have a, an obvious ileal psoas collection. Um, I say obvious, I'll, I'll point it out to you there. Um, so you can see I have markers on the skin which I placed uh, to allow me to work out where my entrance point is going to be. Um, so in this case you see I, I've picked a spot, I've introduced some local anaesthetic and then I am advancing my needle deeper down, introducing the local anaesthetic as we go. I've exchanged my original local needle for my introducer needle. I've pierced the collection and I've inserted a guide wire. And in this case, it was an eight French skater drain. I was able to remove 75 mils of fluid and we sent the uh, resulting fluid off and it confirmed that the patient had uh, tuberculosis within that collection. So they were then restarted on their, um, uh, their anti-TB medication. And this is the post-procedure image. So you can see the drain in place and the vast majority of the collection has been drained there. So we'll, we'll go on to a few more case studies. This is a patient that had an endovascular stent done on their aorta. They had abdominal pain, they had confusion and sepsis. Um, the CT showed the collection next to the graft. This patient was really unwell and uh, again this was uh, done under a, a consent form for with a full anaesthetic team. Um, so we proned the patient and I think you can see there's our ileal psoas collection and just below that image you can see the endovascular stent uh, sitting within the iliac arteries and uh, a little bit of the sort of uh, aneurysm calcified just below. Um, so this is not you know, a procedure which isn't without risk. I'm, I'm putting a needle towards someone's aorta so uh, I'm able to measure the needles that I use. And I'm able to assure that uh, uh, I'm, I'm not physically able to damage any structures by, by using shorter needles but uh, it's all down to measurements and just inching your needle forward ever so slightly each time. So here's my local anaesthetic going in and then a needle straight into the collection. I then remove the sharp portion of that uh, introducer needle and then really all we're playing with is guide wires and plastic tubes. And it's very, very difficult to do any real damage if you're just using guide wires and plastic tubes. At least that's why I keep uh, telling our registrars as I, tell, as, I, as I train them for this type of procedure. So there's my guide wire sitting in there nicely. And then a drain looped up in the centre. So, this patient had a 10 French sk uh, skater drain inserted, 70 mils of franc pus was uh, removed, the patient's antibiotics were changed, the collection completely resolved after two weeks and then the patient was discharged. This is um, the post-procedure image uh, from a week or so later and again you can see my drain is still in place but the collection has completely gone. So uh, this is a 70, sorry, this is a 43 year old chap, seven days post-op. Uh, CT showed a pelvic collection increasing in size uh, despite IV antibiotics. Ah, this is the one I did on Monday, one of the ones I did on Monday, so I do remember this case quite well. Um, so I've got my markers on, I wonder if you can see the collection that we're aiming for there. Well, that's the collection. Um, got a few structures um, to be a bit wary of. In the yellow, we have uh, uh, this chap's uh, rectum, and in the red, uh, that is his internal iliac artery. So we want to keep away from those, um, but we know where they are. We can see exactly where they're going. And uh, so we introduce our needle with some local anaesthetic. We advance that through to the collection. Put a guide wire down, do the exchange. The drain then gets um, put into place. It was only a small collection, 35 mils, but again, we've sent a sample to the lab. Um, those weren't back when I checked today. Normally they take about four days to come through. Um, and uh, this is the uh, post-procedure image. You can see that the drain is in situ, but actually the collection has gone completely. So uh, this drain would be ready for removal sort of a couple of days after uh, we've, we've had the MCNS results back from the lab 
and I've changed the antibiotics just to make sure that uh, um, it has drained completely. We, quite often we'll, off, uh, we'll, we'll ask the team that looking after the patients to flush the drain uh, just to get rid of any of the last um, uh, sort of little bits of infection that you get uh, uh, deep um, adjacent to where the drain is sitting. Another case study, this is an 88 year old lady who was admitted with uh, uh, cholecystitis, so that's my bell. Um, and she has abdominal pain, she has a raised CRP and uh, despite antibiotics uh, she's not getting any better. She's not a surgical candidate. Um, so I've made the call to do a cholecystostomy and um, uh, we start off with our initial image, we put some markers on the skin um, and we can see our gallbladder is this massive area here. But we do have the liver in the way. So um, it's actually a very good idea to, to put our drain through the liver, although it may seem a wee bit counterintuitive because obviously if you, uh, if you penetrate the liver, they can bleed. But when it comes to a cholecystostomy, uh, you, you want the, a little bit of liver just to sort of tamponade the collection and, um, and stop the patient from ending up with biliary sepsis. Um, so here I go. This is my introducer needle, uh, my local anaesthetic. Through the liver into the gallbladder. Uh, guide wire is now in place. And I've introduced an eight French um, transhepatic skater drain and removed 275 mils of frank pus. So this was a very necessary procedure for the patient and has treated her acute sepsis. This is the post-procedure in which you can see the gallbladder has collapsed down completely. Another one, these, these cases, that was another one that I did uh, on Monday. This is one that I did yesterday. This is a, a chap that um, had uh, a nephrectomy actually for a, uh, a staghorn calculus, rather young guy, he's only, um, only in his mid thirties, but he had a post-operative collection and he was readmitted with fever and high inflammatory markers. So this is the initial scan that I've done. This is the collection that we're looking at. So my, in, my initial needle with my local anaesthetic, deeper. My introducer needle now just going down through the muscle, into the, the guide wire going down through the collection. And uh, again, that was a 12 French skater, so a slightly bigger drain, 75 mils of frank pus. And there's the post-procedure image and uh, that's removed all of the collection. You can see a few wee uh, locules of air, but that's perfectly normal post drainage. So a couple more to go. This is uh, a lady that was um, uh, admitted with diverticulitis and then a psoas abscess. Um, I've got re reasonably limited amounts of, uh, to, of room to actually put my drain in. So, so this is the collection that we're talking about. Um, so I put my local anaesthetic uh, in and what I'm starting to do in this case is just to try to move the loop of bowel out of the way by hydro dissecting and that's using a, a mixture of water and local anaesthetic just to give the loop of bowel a bit of a push. Um, I then withdraw the sharp part of the needle and then advance my, again you can see the little pool of, uh, uh, of the local with the, with the water there, advance my needle into the psoas collection and uh, here we drained 100 mils of frank pus. The patient was discharged five days uh, later, uh, again with a change to antibiotics. Uh, and this is, there we are. Uh, last one, so uh, 79 year old chap uh, with ischemic leg, uh, CT angio noted the right uh, groin collection. The patient was acutely septic, so their inflammatory markers were very, very high. Their CRP, which is a measure of infection, was 300, uh, which is incredibly high. So this patient uh, really needed something doing immediately. Um, the problem is that uh, we do our initial image. We can see a big collection here, but we've also got a loop of bowel in the way. Um, and uh, there's no way of passing a drain directly into that. So again, we need to start to think about hydro dissecting. So again, our local anaesthetic needle goes in and uh, again, you can see this is a little pool of water and local. Uh, and it's just giving that loop of bowel a bit of a push out of the way. Uh, I advance the needle a bit deeper 
And again, I'm injecting my local anaesthetic uh, and water mixed together. And you can see the loop of bowel has, um, has come out of way nicely. Uh, again, this is the hydro dissected area. Um, we then push the needle uh, right up against that collection and uh, guide wire and then uh, the, the drain in place. So we had a very limited access on this particular case. Um, we needed a hydro dissect to move the local bowel out of the way. I introduced a 10 French skater drain, uh, removed 45 mils of Frank pus, and there's the drain in place. Okay, that is the end of my presentation. Thank you, Nick. That was wonderful. That was really, really informative. I think we have a couple of questions for you, if that's all right. So I think Charlotte has a question. From yeah, I, we've got one here. So um, Nick, if uh, someone's just qualified, what would the progression pathway be to get to where you are? Is there anything that you suggest to do to aid further professional development in particular? Yeah, so I think one thing you have to consider is that, uh, you know, I, I've been a CT radiographer for 20 or so years before I started doing these procedures. Um, and it, you really do need to know what you're looking at. <laughs> I can't uh, overestimate this is not something that you'll be doing uh, five years down the road. I mean, I, I would love to think that uh, in the future we will end up with that sort of career progression. Well, I think you'll be looking at a decade or so in. So I would say if you're interested in doing this uh, type of procedure, get into CT and just learn your anatomy. And, you know, go into the room for every possible procedure that you can. And, uh, I mean, if you're, if you're working with me and you show an interest, um, then, you know, that's really the way forward. And then it's just a question of uh, sort of getting an established training uh, position. Um, and this is very possible for, for you guys. If I think back 25 years ago, radiologists weren't doing these procedures. You know, CT was in its infancy. We didn't have the equipment that would allow us to do this type of procedure. I never dreamed that uh, the first time I saw one of these done that uh, one day it'd be me doing them. So, you know, it, it is possible, but you, you do need to bide your time. You need to get in, you need to see many, many, many procedures and your anatomy needs to be perfect. Thank Lovely. you, Nick. <laughs> and just one more as well. So um, how do you think COVID has made it more evident that radiographers need to be taking up more advanced practice roles? Do you think it's increased the need for it? Yeah, um, I think uh, I think that there is definitely a position, you know, there's definitely a case for radiographers taking on huge amounts of additional roles. And COVID is, <laughs> we have a massive training crisis in radiology, uh, not so much in radiography, but the radiologists are massively under training uh, for, for the number of cases that, that we get coming through. So having radiographers doing CT head reporting, playing film recording, taking on uh, things like HSGs or drainages or pick lines, it's a real possibility. Um, the fact that the radiologists went off meant that uh, we weren't uh, you know, we didn't really have a huge amount of other options. We had the staff that were trained to do these procedures. And whereas, you know, it may be that I was doing 25% of them pre-COVID, um, when we turned around and actually there was only two of us that were in the department that were able to do them, a radiologist and myself, uh, because everyone else was off um, shielding. So it's, it's allowed us to sort of increase... Um, increase the awareness that radiographers are there and, and are able to do these procedures. Lovely, perfect. Thank you very much. If anyone has any more questions for Nick, then I'm sure if he's happy for you to get in contact with him um, and ask those directly, then go ahead. I'm just slightly conscious of time, so <laughs> we'll move on now. Um, so our final session is entitled A Radiography Student's Perspective of Placement During a Pandemic. So for this, I'm going to stay on the screen with a group of my fellow graduating third years. So I'd like to welcome back Aidan Beverton, as well as Sonny Boston and Kelly Cutsey. And Martin Floyd's going to chair the questioning for this one. Um, so a bit of background on us. Um, all five of us have secured employment in a wide range of variety of hospitals across both England and Wales. And we have a, a variety of experience working in drastically different sized hospitals across South Wales within the last year. 
So Martin's got a couple of questions for us now. We're just going to have a sort of informal chat for a bit um, and then, yeah. Good, excellent. So um, I'll let Aidan and Alice have a bit of a break because they've, they've presented already. Um, and let's think about uh, asking um, Sunny a question. Um, Sunny, as a student, do you feel that COVID-19 has impacted perceptions towards infectious diseases within healthcare? You know, has your sort of attitude, your approach to infectious diseases changed, do you think? I think most definitely. I think um, definitely as a student, it has changed my perception. And I think it's probably changed the perception of many healthcare workers as well. So like kind of to begin with, I feel as though 18 months prior, many of us wouldn't have thought much of going to work or going to placement with a slight sniffle or a, or a sore throat. Like if we fast forward to the present, I think one would find that the situation has changed monumentally. Mm -hmm. So some studies suggest that the pandemic, pandemic has resulted in, in an increase in hand hygiene compliance. Furthermore, the proficient use of PPE and infection control measures has allowed us to protect our patients, colleagues and ourselves. I think that COVID-19 has caused irreparable loss for thousands of people across the UK. However, I feel as though it has changed our perception towards infectious disease in a manner that aids in the protection of patients and staff alike. So I feel as though kind of the consequences of what has occurred in the last 18 months has massively affected all of our viewpoints and also affected the way in which we actually um, act in a clinical environment um, for the betterment of our patients, I think. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, that's a really interesting point, Sunny, that, you know, it's, it's changed, certainly changed your perspective and probably has changed the perspective of your colleagues as well. And I suppose that set, a, set against now um, reports yesterday, um, which have been released by the, sort of the Welsh Government, um, where there has there or there were in the initial stages of COVID quite a significant number of cases uh, of COVID which have been related to COVID death that they now think was probably due to COVID being contracted within the hospital environment. So I think probably as we learn more about COVID and its transmissibility, our approach to infection control has, has certainly has certainly improved. And you know, anecdotally, you hear about incidences of other um, very common hospital acquired infections like Clostridium and, and MRSA um, on the decrease because our perception around infection control has really, really increased. So, uh, yeah, thank you, Sunny. Um, Kelly, so one for me now in terms of, um, of, of your perspective of taking positives from education. I think I talked about that I could see positives from education uh, last time. Um, thinking about, you know, online learning, what was hard about it? What was the biggest challenging for, challenges for you that maybe if we're going to take this forward for other years, then we can avoid replicating that challenge? Yeah, I think um, the biggest challenge for me was, it probably sounds silly to say, but it was the fact that it wasn't in person. It was that I, I missed physically being in a lecture theatre and, you know, being able to talk to people or have a chat with a lecturer at the, at the end of a session. Um, but I, I do, um, I know you put some quotes on as well. I do agree with some people where I think online learning does provide that platform though for people to um, ask those questions that they may not have have done so in a lecture. But yeah. Um, yeah. I think it's the fact that it's, it's a completely different environment to what you're used to. It's, it's difficult to get into that mindset of, you know, you're, you're sat down, you're, you're ready to learn. Whereas physically being there, you get that feeling. Um, mm -hmm. But I think what was, done in terms of like the variety of online um, resources so that, like the videos the um, additional quizzes those definitely help sort of add that variety and the um, hit those sort of different learning styles because for me personally online learning isn't the easiest for me it's not the easiest mm -hmm. way for me to take in information so having that variety of different resources um, definitely was was a big help in that. Brilliant thank you Kelly and I think you know as you see you it, it's been a massive challenge for everyone because, you know, the, the, our school system, I suppose, in the UK and, and college systems doing BTECs and stuff, stuff like that, it's very much about face-to-face, -face, isn't it? You know, the, the, your A-levels yeah. is face-to-face -face with teachers. If you're doing BTECs or whatever in, in a college, it's all about face-to-face -face and suddenly we took that away from you. 
but I thought one of the points you made then um, <clears throat> about having that chat with the lecturer at the end of a, of a session or, or catching the lecturer in the corridor, that that is a big loss for you because that's often the time that, you know, things are fresh in your mind. You want to capture us, you can ask us something afterwards or in those impromptu conversations on the corridor, which has been taken away from us again in the last 13 months. So those little chance encounters of learning have kind of been taken away from us. So some really good perspectives there and good for us to take forward um, into the next academic year and however we want to carry on with some of the positives. Um, Aidan, so do you now think you're prepared to start that band five job in Bridgend at this point in time? You know, I, you know, we miss a lot of placement in second year, but I feel like um, lots of us have put in such an effort into making the most of the placement experience we've had that it got to the point of me at the end of the last block where I felt as though I was sort of contributing to the team as, you know, almost a band five radiographer. So mm. I feel like whilst there's um, missed experience and things that I can learn still, I am quite, um, I feel ready to step into the world of work, you know, even if it means that um, we need longer and more nurturing sort of preceptorship programmes. But I'm very excited actually to start and, um, I can't wait to work in Bridgend as well. I was there in second year in placement. So, um, yeah, I do feel prepared, but I'm aware, well, I'm not aware as such, but I'm sure there are people in um, our cohort, you know, globally um, in the UK that don't feel so prepared. So um, I think it's important that departments, um, they'll, they'll be fully aware, but the departments are more um, ready for providing more support to newly qualified radiographers to ensure that we get that um perceptship and that we gain our confidence but yeah i'm very looking forward to start working yeah i mean as you said aiden it, it's it's definitely a uk wide issue um certainly some of the work that karen and i have done with with ulster um in northern ireland with um uh, robert gordon up in glasgow um, and actually with with a, a university um in the middle east um it's very, it's very much a global issue that students are worried about going into practice, having missed chunks of clinical experience. But having said that, I know certainly from a sort of Welsh perspective and from a Cardiff perspective, our clinical academic tutors have had that dialogue with superintendents and radiology services managers to say, you know, this is what's happened to our students over the last 13 months. And, you know, coming to you on their first day of work, they have missed chunks of clinical work. So there may be that apprehension and maybe putting in place at a very early stage uh, methods of perceptorship and, and, and um, support from that perspective. So, yeah, and, and I certainly know as, a, as an academic team how much extra effort you have all made, all of your colleagues um, in the third year trying to recoup as much of that clinical time as possible. And it's been a struggle, it's been really hard. Alice, um, generally, do you feel that the pandemic has had a negative or maybe a positive influence on students' morale in general? You know, thinking about, I suppose, your experience of student life and your experiences, um, how, how really has, has, that, has, has the pandemic really affected you in your sort of, um, you know, your, your student morale, as it were? I think it's been really difficult, especially being sort of like quite a young undergraduate student. I came straight from school in. Um, so I think it's been quite hard to lose that like social aspect of university because it is a big deal at university, all of the socialising and everything. Um, there were positives to take from it as well. Like I feel like I now know the city that I was living in much better than I did in first and second year because it forced me to go out and find other things to do. Um, I like go on walks for the sake of going on walks, which I'd never do before. And I think it did force me to definitely, I definitely feel like I understand Cardiff as a place better than I did mm. before in that way. Um, but it was, there were definitely, it was definitely hard at points. And there were a couple of points where you're like having to self isolate because you've been in contact with someone and you're missing even more placement time. And then it gets really, really tough because you're obviously everyone has been stuck in the house for the whole year. So you're stuck in the house, you're feel like you can't 
like it, it's a struggle to then catch up on placement hours and all of that and um although everyone was obviously really supportive there is also stuff that needs to get done so that provided like a big extra worry on top of all the normal third year worries so I think yeah. in general I'd say it has had like probably a negative effect on student morale um yeah. but I think it's had a negative effect on morale generally across the entire population and I, there's nothing that can be helped with that really yeah. it's just hoping that onwards and upwards it's taught us all how we deal personally in a difficult situation which is a good life skill to have yeah um, so hopefully looking forward to the future <laughs> yeah no I think you know I, I think Alice I, I have to agree with you I think overall unfortunately you know Covid has had that negative influence on morale there are positives that we can take from it in changes to learning and stuff like that but in terms of your your well-being I, I think it has had a negative effect and I, I, I certainly it's had a negative effect on me in that, I, in that you know working from home is incredibly isolating and mm. I think that's the same for you learning from from home it's isolating for the first year our new first years incredibly isolating they've never really come together as a cohort they haven't met us uh, face to face um, and I think that probably is going to have you know going into the future quite significant issues around mental health uh, and and we hope then that the university will put in, put in place a significant package of support um, ready for, for both students and and staff I suppose um, I'm really conscious of time we've got four minutes to go um, I don't know whether Charlotte wants to sort of pop back in as, as the main organiser but I mean from from my point of view it, this has been an astounding success it's the first time we've ever had a, a, a webinar completely organised by students the whole content the the planning the idea behind the talks has all come from you it's been incredibly positive um, I think you're incredibly lucky and I think Sunny probably had a very big part to play in getting in getting Nick I think Nick's talk was was really outstanding really to show where we can go as radiographers yeah 25 years ago 30 years ago when I started I would never have thought a radiographer would be draining um, a smelly pus filled um, uh, you know sort of a septic area on, in someone's abdomen that was you know that was a wow factor for the odd radiologist but but now Nick has proven that we can get there and I hope that's a really incentive story for you um, as students going forward um, that, you know, you're going to be able to um, take up those roles. And I know looking at your faces there that I, I know some of you are, are really eager to get into those advanced roles. And um, I think, Nick, uh, if Sunny comes back to uh, to Watford, you may you may have to watch your job because I think... Uh, there's a second interventional radiographer in the in the training there. Anyway, I'll hand back to Charlotte as, as the organiser, but thank you, everybody. Thanks, Martin. Yeah, I mean, from my perspective, I just want to say thanks, everyone, for uh, joining the session. Um, I hope you found it really interesting. Um, certainly, Nick, you know, your session was uh, so interesting to listen to and to learn a lot from. Uh, and I kind of echo what Martin said with it. You know, hopefully uh, radiography as a profession can be starting to be pushed forward a lot more uh, and as students just joining it you know I think that you, you've got um, such a fascinating career in front of you um, and thanks to all of you students for um, putting a lot of this together and for presenting um, and for just taking part so um, thank you very much I'm going to pass over to Alice actually and then she's going to just close the session for everyone but thank you very much. Yeah, I just kind of wanted to echo what everyone's already said. So, <laughs> um, yeah, just a massive thank you to everyone who helped us um, put content together for us and Charlotte for helping us organise it all and Gareth for doing all the technology behind the scenes. Um, it's, yeah, been a really lovely evening and thank you everyone for coming and listening. It's been really informative from everyone and I thought I've had a really good time. Um, if anyone has any questions for any of us, then feel free to get in contact with me. I'll put my email in the chat box in a second. Um, and then you can feel free to get in contact with me and I'll put you in contact with the relevant people. Um, I'll just do that quickly now. There we are. Um, and I will get certificates out to people in the next few days. Bear with me because I'm going to have to make them all by hand. Um, but you all gave your um, email addresses when you signed up for the conference so I'll email them out to you on those email addresses um, 
yeah I hope everyone's enjoyed their evening and I hope it's been informative for all of you and thank you very much for coming bye 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 everyone thank you. Bye.